Good afternoon. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services, and I will moderate the COVID-19 update for Friday, May 1st. We are joined today by the Minister for Justice, Tracy Ann McPhee, and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name, and you will each have one question plus one follow-up. If we have time at the end, we will entertain one or two more questions. Today, for our French-speaking journalists, you are encouraged to ask your questions in French. We have with us a representative from the French Language Services Directorate, André Boursier, who will translate those questions for those who do not speak French. Thank you. Minister McPhee. Thank you. Thanks very much. A little over a month ago, we declared an emergency under the Civil Emergency Measures Act here in the territory. And since that time, we have issued a number of orders to help keep Yukoners safe and supported during the COVID-19 pandemic and resulting state of emergency. I have three new orders to share uh, with you today. These orders are specifically designed to help Yukoners during this challenging time. Our government knows that COVID-19 pandemic restrictions, while critical to protect health and safety of Yukoners, do present their own challenges. These new orders are not about restrictions. First, we are providing deputy ministers with the option and the authority to renew or extend the terms of leases or other forms of statutory approvals, permits, licenses, and certificates that would otherwise expire during the state of emergency or during the 90-day period immediately following that. We've taken this step to safeguard the validity of licenses, permits, leases, and other authorizations that may be otherwise expiring during the state of emergency time period. It is important to note that these extensions or timeline alterations apply only to timelines that are set out in Yukon law The next ministerial order relates to government contracts. Our government is working to support individuals and businesses who do not at this time have the capacity to meet legal or contractual obligations under contracts, certain contracts. This order provides authority for deputy ministers to alter the terms of contracts only if necessary. This would mean that altering or extending the time for the performance of contracts or obligations that might be under the contracts or providing the authority to take other necessary actions included those that relate to subcontracts. Deputy ministers will only do this when the circumstances relate to the COVID-19 pandemic and they warrant a change. These changes will be accomplished through a change order to the contract and be publicized. The last order relates to civil and family court limitation periods. Although courts are still operating, we are taking steps to ensure that Yukoners have access to the justice system and that it is not impeded as a result of this current state of emergency. For example, if an individual is required to self-regulate after returning from travel, or they become ill, or they lack the financial means uh, due to their employment situation, uh, they may not be in a position where they're able to meet certain timelines that are required by the court process. In response to these realities, limitation periods established under Yukon law for initiating a civil or a family action or an appeal or a proceeding which would have expired during the state of emergency or within 30 days after the state of emergency will now expire 90 days after the state of emergency ends. The same extension will apply to the initiation of prosecutions under Yukon law. The order allows judges and statutory decision makers that are operating under Yukon law to waive or suspend or extend the time periods as they deem necessary for up to 90 days after the state of emergency. 
The order on limitation periods also provides an extension for affidavits and statutory declarations that may be required under Yukon law. Specifically, where an affidavit or a statutory declaration would have normally been due during the state of emergency or up to 10 days after the state of emergency, the timeline is now extended for 30 days after the state of emergency. Our government has made these ministerial orders as a proactive step because we know that Yukon businesses, individuals and others are all feeling the impact of COVID-19. We believe that providing direct authority to the deputy ministers provides for timely responses to the evolving circumstances in the face of the current state of emergency. Our government will continue to work tirelessly to provide relief, support and guidance through this very unusual time. Finally, I'd like to inform you, Connors, that the first charge for a violation under the Civil Emergency Measures Act has been brought. An individual has been charged with failing to self-isolate after returning from travel and is scheduled to appear before the court on May the 5th, 2020. Lastly, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all Yukoners who are complying with the orders to protect the health and safety in our territory and for taking care of each other at this very difficult time. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Thank you. Dr. Hanley. Thank you and thank you, Minister McPhee. <clears throat> today is a good day. It's the 1st of May. It even feels like spring outside with the sun shining for the first time in a while. And this morning, I even heard a robin, my favorite harbinger of a Yukon spring. On the COVID case count, we now have 11 cases recovered out of our total of 11 confirmed cases. And we are two weeks since our last case was diagnosed. So the question on everyone's lips and minds is when will Yukon be announcing its plan for reopening? Just the other day, I received a message from a five-year-old little girl. She sent me this heart-melting little video of thanks, but she also asked me when she could hug her friends again. Her question is simple, touching, and important. And in a way, that question sums up what we all want to do. We want to be close again with each other. We want to get back to work. We want to go back to serving food and enjoying meals in restaurants and getting a haircut. We want to start digging out of the huge financial holes that so many are in. I want to tell you that even though the government is yet to announce an official reopening date, that there is a lot of work going on right now on the details of what a plan should look like and what the different phases should contain as we work through the incremental steps of opening up. So we are getting there. As I stated this past Tuesday, along with the Premier, the current first step is reaffirming what people and businesses can do right now or as soon as they are ready. Keep in mind that many areas were never closed. Camps are preparing to run with modified plans. Farmers markets are getting readied. Many of our allied health professionals who have closed for safety reasons are working out plans for re reopening. Retail establishments who have never been ordered to close are taking another look at how they can open or expand. And some of the hospital restrictions on non-urgent procedures and tests will be lifted. Earlier this week, both Premier Silver and I touched on the work we are doing to prepare for reinvigorating our COVID-contained lives in Yukon. That's still a work in progress and requires many wise heads around the table. Life will not go back to what it was before for a long time, but we can definitely get some of our normal back. I know that people are getting tired of the restrictions that have been put in place. People see our low numbers and wonder why we have to keep things locked down so tightly. They look to our neighbours in the south and see that slowly but surely other parts of Canada are opening up. It's really important to remember, though, that Yukon is ahead of almost everyone else in the course of this disease. Here in Yukon, while people feel we have taken drastic measures 
and to some extent we have, we have not had to go as far as many of the provinces had to. As our neighbours open up, much of what they are doing in their first phases will be catching up to where we are now. We want to take a calm and measured approach to op reopening the territory, and more details will be coming in week by week. We want to take incremental steps, test the waters, and if all goes well, then walk in a little deeper. I'm happy to be able to tell you today that the Yukon Hospital Corporation is going to begin a limited increase in some hospital services that were temporarily suspended over the last month to help spread the, to help limit the spread of COVID-19. And this includes elective and non-urgent services such as blood work, x-rays, imaging tests, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and appointments with visiting specialists. All of these services will be provided by appointment only so the hospital can maintain physical distancing and ensure the safety of vulnerable populations and our treasured healthcare workers. I know that people have made and continue to make sacrifices on a daily basis. You've all worked extremely hard to keep yourselves and your families and your neighbors safe from COVID-19. Yukon is one of the few jurisdictions in Canada without community spread. And Yukoners are safe because of your vigilance, caring, and continued thoughtfulness in protecting the most vulnerable. I appreciate, though, that the safety has come at a great and unforeseen cost to our economy, to our relationships, and to our mental health. As we move towards a formal reopening strategy, we're building the means to measure not just the required standards we need to maintain, such as testing capacity, public health and health care capacity, but also the spectrum of effects that can result either from COVID or the consequences of our preventative measures. This additional surveillance will inform us how we respond to unintended consequences and balance positive health behaviors and the social determinants of health with the need to stop the spread of COVID-19. It's now time to actively balance our efforts in controlling COVID with concerted plans to boost Yukoners' financial security, the connections we have to each other, and our well-being. I'm hearing the voices loud and clear that say, come on, We've only got 11 cases, nothing new for two weeks, open up already. It's hard to say not yet. It's hard to say soon, but slowly. I know there is money being lost. Yet, on the other hand, there are those who are un uncomfortable with plans to reopen Yukon due to fears about the pandemic getting worse here. So I hope I can reassure you that we are being very careful and cautious in our plan to, uh, to move towards reopening and addressing the economic challenges for Yukon. It's so important that we all as Yukoners understand that regular connection is an essential part of human well-being and mental health. The term social distancing in retrospect was never a good fit. We should have been talking about physical distancing and social adaptation from the start. Our social, cultural, and familial connections are essential to us keeping whole, helping us to feel a part of something bigger, and reassuring us that we're cared about and that we matter. Whether it's my little five-year-old friend Grace wanting to hug her friends, grandparents being separated from grandchildren, children and youth unable to see their friends, students being away from teachers, athletes unable to work with their coaches, or simply the chosen family we have here in Yukon being unable to gather to support one another through difficult times. This is a hardship we've been enduring apart from one another. So while we remain physically distant, please continue to make connections to one another a priority in your life. Whether it's having a physically distanced check-in with your neighbor, speaking to your loved ones via a virtual platform, or simply smiling at fellow Yukoners while doing regular errands, Connection is an integral part of health and wellness. By now, we're, we're collectively realizing that we will have lost many things to the pandemic. The loss of life is important to acknowledge and is tragic. We know Yukoners have lost family members, both, both in Yukon and from afar during this time, and we grieve with you. But other important parts of our lives will be and have been lost as well. 
It's impossible to name the loss of every single transition and rite of passage during this time. But a few specific lo losses we can acknowledge. We know that cultural gatherings, even those that don't happen every year, like Moosehide, have been cancelled. The sacrifices that First Nations are making when they choose to make these cancellations cannot be understated. I've heard of cancellations of weddings, trips of a lifetime, families unable to join each other here and elsewhere for other special events like births or reunions. And finally, we all grieve our fantastic festivals like Dhaka, Dawson City, our honorary Yukon Atlan Music Festival. We're all anxiously awaiting the time we can gather to celebrate music and the arts again. For many, mental health up to now may have been taking a back seat to physical health concerns. It's, a, it's as important to consider what keep our minds and spirits healthy during these times as how to keep our bodies healthy. Rather than ignore or put aside feelings of stress or distress, it's better to acknowledge them and see what proactive steps we can take to reduce their impact. I'd like to remind you again to limit your consumption of the news, especially of sources on social media, unless you're watching this now, of course, on Facebook. It's important to focus on the things you enjoy about your life and the things you need to get done in the day. Spending too much time monitoring the latest developments of COVID-19 in the news can make us all feel anxious, hopeless, or overwhelmed. Focus on what you can control. We can control how much media we consume, how careful we are about hand washing, reaching out to friends and family. Focus on what we have in Yukon to be able to support our mental health, access to the land, to walk on our trails, to see the sun come back to warm our lives, the ability to play outside, relative safety, a kind community that cares about us. We can maintain healthy routines of sleep, food, connection, exercise, valued activities and hobbies. And consider your connection to spirituality and culture. What practices can you do or renew to feel a part of something bigger in your life? Reaching out to mental health support, whether through your community nurse, your family doctor, psychiatrist, through private counseling services, or through Yukon's mental wellness and substance use services is also so important when help is needed for you or for a loved one. And finally, a note to my small friend, Grace, who wants to hug her friends. I will say, not yet, but hang in there <laughs> and make the most of what you can with hugs to your mom and to your dad, to all the virtual hugs you can continue to give to your grandparents and to your friends. This looks like another beautiful weekend, so Grace, don't forget to play outside and even play with your friends while outside at a well-spaced distance. Thank you. Merci. Kwanastish. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. We'll now go to the reporters online. Gord, Yukon News. I don't have any questions. Okay. We'll move down to Jane from CBC. Hi. Uh, my questions are for Minister McPhee. Uh, it's about the charge under the FEMA um, order. Can you uh, give a few more details about the situation and the, how the person uh, allegedly failed to self-isolate? Uh, thanks. Thanks for that question. I, I can't do that because I don't have that information. Uh, I have been provided with the information that I've given you, which is that a charge was laid on an individual uh, uh, that uh, it, it is has uh, is alleged to have occurred in and around Whitehorse, where the individual failed to self-isolate uh, pursuant to the direction and uh, uh, an order uh, under the Civil Emergency Measures Act uh, that they were uh, directed to do that upon returning from outside the Yukon Territory. Uh, but the other uh, information that you've asked for would be evidence uh, in the hearing of the matter, and I don't have that. Follow-up, Jane? I, I do have a, another question, um, and it, it is a little bit about something Dr. Hanley touched on which is, you know, we have all of our cases recovered. Um, there is, I think, a little bit of fatigue people are feeling about 
um, maintaining the physical distance and, and following the orders. I've seen examples of people, you know, not following uh, orders around town. Um, and we had the story this morning about there's been over a thousand people, non-residents through the territory going on to the Northwest Territories or Alaska. So, uh, and it seems like there's no system in place to track when these people leave the territory. Why have some of these orders in place when it doesn't seem like they're enforceable and people are having this fatigue? Will we, will we be seeing any changes or do you have any, I guess, words of wisdom for, for the public? Yeah, thanks for that uh, question, uh, Jane. You know, for one thing, enforcements are part of the picture, and I know I've said this a few times before, but I'll say it again. Um, enforcement are, is one mechanism to reinforce um, an order or um, 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 an order that's um, issued under SEMA, but there's also uh, other ways to reinforce, and that includes uh, communication and support. So I think all of those aspects are important. And we know that on the that there was a lag between um, order and the mechanisms to enforce. And then there's always going to be a lag between the the, uh, the effectiveness of the mechanisms um, and the application of the mechanisms. And uh, enforcement will never be complete. Um, but it is another mechanism, not just to enforce individual cases, but to remind people, perhaps as in this case, that this is something that uh, we take seriously, that self-isolation. We also have to make sure that we're continually communicating the importance of self-isolation, that we make the information um, available. And I think we're, we're continually tweaking that to make sure that when we hear feedback, that we, we address ways to make the information more clear and more available. Um, I do think uh, that part of the going forward strategy with opening up uh, absolutely relies on maintaining the safe six that I talked about the other day, and that is the those six measures of physical distancing, hand washing, staying home when you're sick, and um, uh, uh, reducing travel to the communities, and uh, um, observing self-isolation when self-isolation is, is required. And it's fundamental that we keep reminding, we keep communicating, and we keep emphasizing that. So uh, I think it's natural, that, and, and it's, we recognize that there is going to be fatigue. It's hard to maintain. We, we're all going to have our lapses. So um, although enforcement is part of that, and I, and I recognize it needs to happen, I also think that uh, it's, it's going to be difficult to run after all of the individual lapses, but to collectively uh, work together and remind ourselves, improve our communications for the, the greater good. Because the more compliance per percentage of the population that's compliant, the, be the better your safety net. Um, and it's almost like vaccinations. If we have 95% measles vaccination, uh, we know that measles will not circulate in the community. Um, so if we have uh, a certain goal, of course, we don't know the exact number, but, you know, 80, 90, 95 percent compliance, even if there are lapses, we know that that's going to put us in a, in a very solid position to protect ourselves. We'll move now to Gabrielle, Whitehorse Star. Hi, just to follow up on Jane's question, when you suggested that, you know, there's this lag in enforcement and things are being tweaked as we go, can you elaborate a little bit on what we've learned so far, what has changed and what is still going to change with those enforcement rules? Uh, thanks. Thank you very much for the question. I think I'll try uh, to answer it for you. And in in uh, addition to what uh, Dr. Hanley has already said, which is you know critically important, um, we have to remember that individuals uh, entering the territory are required to sign a declaration. Uh, that is a promise that they will comply with the uh, provisions of the orders uh, and that uh, if and when they fail to do so, there are consequences to that. Uh, it is, of course, a promise to comply with those. Uh, there are enforcement officers identified in uh, virtually every community and support for them in, in those communities. Uh, we have, of course, uh, 
encourage the public if they are concerned about uh, uh, a situation to uh, report that situation to the uh, COVID-19 enforcement uh, email, which is COVID-19 enforcement at gov.yk.ca. Uh, there will soon be a telephone line up, up as well that uh, such reports uh, can be made. Uh, I should uh, note that those complaints are followed up on uh, by the uh, enforcement team uh, that individuals are spoken to and, uh, and certainly uh, investigations of those complaints uh, are done. Uh, we um, I should note also that there's partnership with, for instance, the City of Whitehorse bylaw officers uh, having uh, an opportunity to talk to individuals that are here uh, in town if they uh, it's a report is made or they're discovered that uh, perhaps they shouldn't be. Uh, I can also indicate that uh, corridor maps uh, are about to be issued to individuals passing through uh, the territory so that they will be required to be within uh, certain uh, distance from the uh, Alaska Highway and follow a route that they've indicated to the enforcement officers they intend to use going through the territory. Uh, and then uh, obviously that will help with indicating uh, uh, individuals that are not uh, following uh, along uh, that corridor. Uh, clearly uh, an individual's passing through from say Watson Lake uh, entry point into the Yukon Territory up through Alaska uh, wouldn't be seen anywhere on uh, any place but the Alaska Highway and the road that travels through uh, to Alaska, not in Carmax, for instance, not off of that road, and certainly um, and not in the city of Whitehorse, for instance. There will be provisions, uh, opportunities for people to get gas and food and those kinds of things, but uh, not to uh, enter our communities and not to, uh, not to potentially uh, cause uh, concern if, uh, if they have been infected or, or don't know that they might be infected. So all of these measures together, among others, uh, are uh, a good example of, uh, of how the enforcement is uh, practically playing out. Next question, Gabrielle. Yeah, and, and just to follow that, you mentioned that there are enforcement officers identified in every community. I'm curious what the chain of communication is between enforcement officers and communities and municipal powers and also other departments within government. Sort of, does everybody know, <clears throat> pardon me, what's going on within enforcement? Uh, the uh, issues that are, the, sorry, the orders that are issued under the Civil Emergency Measures Act, a variety of them, you all uh, heard about some today, and of course we know the uh, ones requiring self-isolation and, uh, and border controls uh, are managed by the uh, uh, Emergency Coordination Center, uh, which has been set up under the Civil Emergency Measures Act, and uh, enforcement officers report to, uh, to that office, uh, and uh, we are uh, encouraged and very uh, uh, open uh, and uh, supported by uh, relationships with uh, communities, uh, with First Nations communities, and the opportunity for individuals in those communities to uh, coordinate with the uh, Emergency Coordination Centre, and uh, that happens on a regular basis. Thank you. We'll move now to Claudia and Radio Canada. Uh, oui, euh, Dr. Henley, pour euh, les fins de la radio, si c'est possible de me répéter ce que vous disiez par rapport à la place du Yukon dans cette pandémie euh, au pays. Comment le Yukon se compare par rapport au reste du pays? Et, et incidemment, si vous diriez que vos mesures en place ont fonctionné. Uh, the question is for Dr. Henley. Uh, the question is about uh, how is the Yukon comparing to the rest of Canada and um, how the measures that were put in place uh, are effective and compared to what has been done elsewhere in Canada. Bon, uh, Claudiane, um C'est difficile de, de, de comparer uh, ben chaque par chaque, uh, et, uh, mais on, on peut dire qu'on reste avec uh, quelques autres uh, endroits dans une position de ne pas avoir de, um, uh, de transmission uh, de, uh, de, dans la communauté. Uh, ça veut dire la, la transmission à sans origine uh, identifiée qui était liée à... 
um, a voyage uh, um, um, autre, um, au, uh, dehors de Yukon. Uh, donc, on, on reste, par exemple, uh, on, on, dans une position comparative aux autres uh, territoires et um, des, um, des autres, uh, de quelques autres um, provinces uh, comme uh, l'île Prince-Édouard. Um, mais, et pour les mesures, c'est compliqué parce qu'il y a tellement une variété de mesures appliquées, mais peut-être le plus important que c'est les frontières euh, de nous sont fermées euh, et ça compare euh, avec euh, les autres territoires, les deux autres territoires, et euh, en partie avec l'île Prince-Édouard, peut-être par le... Ça, c'est peut-être la mesure la plus importante qui, qui nous distingue des autres, euh, des autres provinces, euh, surtout les grandes provinces. Et donc, c'est ça qui, qui doit continuer en place pour nous permettre d'ouvrir euh, la territoire, de, de, de réouvrir des services euh, ou d'avoir une ouverture au, euh, au Yukon euh, pendant qu'on peut rester euh, avec les contrôles euh, sur, la, sur la frontière. Prochaine question, Claudiane. Oui Just test uh, André Boursier's translation abilities. <laughs> Pour uh, la ministre de la Justice, à savoir, donc, si on envisage une réouverture, un assouplissement des mesures, pourquoi ordonner aujourd'hui plus de mesures uh, restrictives ou dans le système de la justice? So the question is for the Minister of Justice. Uh, since the Yukon is contemplating the possibility of reopening uh, most of uh, the, uh, the businesses and the, the, uh, the activities in the Yukon, why are we announcing today uh, more restrictive measures than what was in place uh, prior to today? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, the three orders that I've issued today are not about restricting. Uh, sorry, I haven't issued them. I've mentioned today and I'm explaining today. Uh, they've been issued, of course, uh, by the uh, Minister of Community Services pursuant to the Civil Emergency Measures Act. Uh, they are not restrictions. They are uh, uh, an opportunity for, uh, as provided by the Civil Emergency Measures Act, for uh, certain legislative or uh, statutory requirements that cannot be met at this time of an emergency to be uh, temporarily changed for the purpose of allowing people to uh, to uh, have the benefit of that. So uh, in the case of limitation periods in court, uh, if the limitation periods were permitted to continue to uh, to operate without uh, the uh, addition of this uh, order under the Civil Emergency Measures Act, uh, an individual might be out of time to bring a court case or to file an affidavit or to uh, determine file documents for a decision in family court. Uh, those are uh, restrictions that, as a result of the operation of a state of emergency, individuals should not be uh, impeded uh, by those. Uh, the other uh, ones I've mentioned today are uh, extensions of things like licenses or leases, for instance, uh, which uh, could expire uh, during this period of time, but some an individual or business might not be able to extend it or to get in touch with the individuals that uh, need to deal with the matter because of either their own self-isolation uh, their own illness or the uh, uh, op operation of the other restrictions under the COVID-19 orders. Uh, so these are not restrictions. Uh, and I, uh, I'm very pleased, I'm sure as everyone is, to hear the advice of uh, Dr. Hanley and a plan to go forward at being worked on by uh, everyone uh, with respect to possible reopening or lessening of restrictions. But uh, the, those will not happen overnight. And uh, we have people uh, today, for instance, whose driver's license might expire today, but uh, needs to uh, have that extended. So uh, those are all uh, the orders that have been put in place that I've mentioned today uh, are all for the purposes of making, uh, of responding to the needs of Yukoners and making their lives a little bit easier at this difficult time. Uh, and uh, they will be extended to uh, match uh, with the period of time of the state of emergency or up to 30 to 90 days after that. Thank you, Minister McPhee. Julie, oh, sorry, go ahead. 
just add something uh, in, in, in general terms uh, in English and then b briefly in French. But uh, I think it's a, there's a good theme here that Claudienne points out. And I would say, in order to relax, we need to be strict. And that is that in order to be able to relax measures, we need to keep our border control strict, at least for the, the, the weeks ahead of us, until transmission risk from uh, outside Yukon is the same as, as it is in Yukon um, or close to what it is in Yukon. So we need that, that strict control to stay in place. So that includes the, the strict orders around um, self-isolation because until the risk goes down, we, um, we are um, not going to be in a good position to open up um, to open up inside Yukon. The same with the strict observance of physical distancing and hand washing and those other safe six measures, that those need to stay in place. So it's that, it's that trade-off. If, if we do this, if we set the, the standard around the border, if we continue the, the physical measures, then we can, we can start to open up. Donc c'est juste pour, en, en sommaire, c'est juste pour dire que c'est pour... pour Pour continuer en balance, il faut avoir des, des, des contrôles stricts euh, aux frontières et il faut observer les, les mesures euh, de distance euh, physique euh, et de, de, de sanitation et tout ça pour avoir la liberté de réouvrir le territoire. Thank you. Julien, Aurore Boréal? Des questions, merci. Okay, we'll move to Tim, CKRW. Hi, good afternoon. A question for Minister McPhee, and just clarification here. The, the charge under the uh, the act, uh, when was, I, I appreciate you can't get into detail, details, but a date, when, I guess, were they caught? Uh, thanks for the question, Tim. The uh, charge was laid yesterday. I, th I don't want to get that wrong, but my uh, I was informed of it yesterday, uh, and uh, it alleges an offence that occurred uh, in uh, uh, early to mid, uh, I want to say mid to uh, later April. Horse? Sorry, I didn't hear that. In oh. Whitehorse? Oh, sorry, yes, in Whitehorse. Okay, and I'd have another uh, question just... In regards to the uh, the White Horse Emergency Shelter and enforcement of, I guess, social distancing guidelines, uh, granted that there's limited capacity at the uh, emergency shelter, uh, some people have moved over to other businesses. And just as an example, Alpine Bakery, apparently people are getting out of the wind uh, by, you know, going into the, the front kind of lobby there, even during the overnight hours. Would you make any suggestions to your counterparts at Health and Social Services that maybe more needs to be done to kind of accommodate uh, those who are left out due to the restrictions at the emergency shelter? I, I can say a few things to that, Tim. Um, uh, firstly, um, as you know, there have been many changes made um, and I, I think that was uh, featured in recent media about about the the number of changes that were made to um, uh, to the shelter in order to accommodate to that to the COVID reality, while at the same time continuing to provide the maximum number of, of services um, to the population in need, to the people in need. Um, and this was a very, very carefully and and, and thorough exercise. But but I um, but I do realize. Um, that there are, are are still effects that are d distressing the uh, the neighborhood and and some of the local um, nearby businesses. So um, it's uh, it, it's complicated. It's a, it's again a matter of addressing needs of the people, while um, while, uh, while while really um, accommodating uh, um, everyone's needs in, in the neighborhood. Um, I think it would be uh, simplistic to say, I know what the solution is, but I think we, we all recognize the problem and need to just continue to uh, look at solutions that work for everyone. Thank you. We have time for one more question, if anyone would like to jump in. I have a, I have a question. Go ahead, please. Um, this is a question, I'm not sure if it's for Minister McPhee or for Dr. Hanley, but... Um, I guess 
why are people who are traveling through the territory on their way to the Northwest Territories or Alaska allowed to visit businesses, uh, you know, on their travel through that they list in their travel plan? But Yukoners returning to the territory must immediately self-isolate. It seems like there's a disconnect there. I can say something if you want. Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. I think it's Jane. Um, I just, I know it's Jane, but I just want to make sure that that's the right voice. Uh, I, I think the um, the issue is that it's about allowing individuals to get uh, necessities for the purposes of their travel. You'll recall that they're required to travel uh, in the territory and then out of the territory within a 24-hour period, which uh, it doesn't take to drive that uh, length. But uh, of course, individuals need to uh, be able to pull off on the side of the road and sleep or rest. Uh, they need to be able to obtain gas. They need to be able to obtain uh, uh, food if uh, necessary and uh, the uh, restrictions that apply uh, to them and the direction that they've been given are restrictive. Uh, of course, we've also spoken to uh, businesses along the way and are aware that some uh, individuals uh, who are traveling through the territory might be stopping there and they have taken uh, their own precautions to abide by the rules and uh, the uh, orders that are in place, uh, safe uh, social distancing, uh, hand washing, uh, et cetera, opportunities to wipe down uh, credit card machines. Uh, we've heard all kinds of uh, opportunities and, and things that folks have put in place to uh, protect themselves and to protect the individuals who are traveling through. But it's a purpose of, uh, of obtaining necessities. Thank you very much. This ends today's update. We'll be back on Tuesday. May 5th at 2 p.m. with the next COVID-19 update. We're clear.